Welcome everyone to uh, the second workshop in our spring 2021 FAST Center at Illinois SBIR Sprint. Uh, we are happy to have you here. Some of you may have attended last week as well. Um, some of you, this may be your first week uh, stopping in on this. Regardless, we have consistent SBIR related programming. So if you missed last week, don't worry. Uh, we will have that um, on video very shortly, I believe on our YouTube channel where you can see that one as well. Um, I am very pleased to welcome Jed Taylor who has uh, been helping companies uh, translate uh, their commercial opportunities to the SBIR program. Uh, for many, many years and has helped um, many companies as uh, get to through the process, but also has served as a reviewer of SBIRs and will relate that experience here today. Um, Jed is the director of the Technology Entrepreneur Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, and we're happy to have him as part of our FAST Center. So thank you so much, Jed, for being here and leading our workshop today. Thank you, Laura. I am happy to be here, and I recognize many of you online today. Uh, I, I've talked with many of you over the last few months and happy to help. I am, uh, I'll am i give a little bit of background on myself for those that, that I don't know, and I've put some slides together today. I'll be talking about, this is our second workshop in the series, and I put together some slides around uh, the commercialization plan of an SBIR uh, proposal. I'm going to talk a little bit about customer discovery, and then I'll talk about support letters. And then I've put some slides in the appendix around uh, the review process and some pitfalls if we get to there. I want to leave about 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers, if there are any that pop up. Uh, also, if uh, any questions pop up along the way that I don't see in the chat, Laura, please interrupt me. Uh, I've got things spread across different screens and I'll probably like miss them if they pop up in chat. So, and, and, and if somebody else just wants to interrupt me as well, feel free to do that too. I kind of struggle with like pictures over here and everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? We've all been on Zoom for a year. So uh, if I miss something, just interrupt me. Uh, okay, so with that, uh, here's the agenda that I've got. I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I'll introduce myself a little bit about in my background just briefly. Uh, so we have a little bit of context. I'll talk a little bit about objectives that I have when I'm putting together an SBIR. I've written lots of these proposals over the years and helped many uh, put together uh, proposals as well. I'll talk about customer discovery and why that's important, I feel, in proposals. And then I'll talk about sections of commercialization plan and what I like to see in commercialization plans. And then I'll talk about letters of support. Okay, so introduction. Uh, uh, so I, I serve as an entrepreneur in residence here at Research Park. I've done that for probably 12, no, actually probably going on 11 or 12 years now. Uh, as Laura mentioned, I'm the executive director of the entrepreneur, uh, Technology Entrepreneur Center in the Granger College of Engineering. So before that, I think it's an important part of the context uh, that, uh, that you know this. So before uh, I took on these roles, uh, I helped launch a startup called Pattern Insight that launched here out of Enterprise Works. That was an SBIR funded company. I launched that with my advisor out of the computer science department. Uh, she was my advisor when I was a student here in, in the College of Engineering. So we went through the, the entire SBIR process uh, from a phase one. There was something called a phase one B at the time in NSF uh, that no longer exists. And then we went through some other supplementary pro, supplemental programs. And then we did the phase two, phase two B and then launched. And through that experience, we ended up getting involved with i -Corps later on when the i -Corps program launched because our program director in the SBIR program actually uh, helped create the, uh, the i -Corps program. So I'm very familiar with the uh, SBIR program. And through that experience, I was asked to speak at the SBIR conference a couple of times. And then I ended up becoming a reviewer for the SBIR program. So uh, I'm very happy with the SBIR program. It helped keep us afloat during the, uh, the recession. Uh, uh, back in 2008, uh, but we used it as a toolkit. It wasn't our only source of funding. And so I've got uh, lots of thoughts on, on why that shouldn't, you shouldn't only depend on SBIRs, but uh, very grateful for the program. And it really is a, a very beneficial for launching companies. Uh, I mentioned, I spoke at the SBIR, SBIR conference a few times about how to acquire customers. 
And then uh, I've, I've been a frequent reviewer ever since then, but uh, I, I can speak highly enough about SBIR uh, uh, dollars as long as you use them correctly. So uh, SBIR, I, I, so I, I talk a lot about NSF because that's the one I'm most familiar with. And I think it's one of the best programs, but they're all very similar. Uh, they typically have a, a, some type of introduction or an elevator pitch. And then they typically have a uh, commercial opportunity section, section about innovation, company team and technical discussion and R&D plan. Okay, so I, I'm gonna focus on the commercial uh, opportunity. I'll try and talk general enough because like I said, there, the, you, you always have to review the proposals or solicitations specifically for the different agencies because they're all different. But in general, the commercialization sections are often uh, uh, very similar. Okay, so kind of to frame where I'm coming from for, uh, today for this presentation, uh, one of the questions I often get asked is, what do you see between a successful SBIR proposal, one that's funded and one that's not funded? And to me, one of, I, 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 and also I'm just going to say that like, uh, if you're all here in this presentation, chances are you've got a solid technology and that I just assume that that's a given, right? If, if you're, if you're working, uh, if, if you're especially if you're at a university and a, a top notch university, or if you're in the ecosystem working with one of our, uh, you know, a similar if you're working with Enterprise Works or a similar university, I, I think I'm just going to go into it assuming that you've got a solid technology that fits with one of the programs. And then it comes down to just how you write your proposal and put it together uh, and, and you prepare for it. So if that's a given, then to me, when I see a, the difference between a successful proposal and one that's not, it typically comes down to a few things. And for me, over the years, my experience has been down to a couple of, uh, a couple of key factors. Sure, there's, there's probably a bunch of other ones and you can really easily screw one up, but it comes down to a couple of key things. And to me, the, uh, the, the key factors are customer discovery. And what I mean by that is going out and talking to customers and making sure that you're solving a problem that needs to be solved. And let me just say that th this, this is a real experience of mine is when I reviewed, when I was reviewing these 10 years ago, very rarely did you ever see a proposal where they actually involved a customer in it. I remember sitting at a, at a uh, reviewing these at, at, at the National Science Foundation 10 years ago and actually reviewing a proposal where the proposal actually listed. It was a, and I know that specifically who the customer was, they actually said, they, they said that we went actually talked to this customer and they said this, this, and this. And I remember elbowing the person next to me and saying, look, they actually talked to somebody and they actually talked to two customers. And it was, it was eye-opening because you rarely ever saw a proposal that talked to somebody that was outside of their lab. And this was way before the i program was created. And so uh, when you saw that, it was eye-opening. Nowadays, you see most proposals have actually done some customer discovery. They just don't, most of them don't do it well. But the difference between a successful one and a, and a not non-successful one is good customer discovery, okay? The second thing is solid support letters, okay? So if you, put a, if you put a proposal together, especially with NSF, you have the opportunity to put in support letters. And there's a big difference between just average and crummy support letters and really good support letters. And so we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about those later and what I would, uh, what I consider solid support letters. Okay, so we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I think those are the those those are two of the key things. Assuming that your technical plan uh, is in good shape and you've got uh, you've got uh, solid technology and innovation, which I, I always assume is a given that you can do that. Okay, so uh, putting a, co a solid customer discovery process. Uh, let me just briefly just say to talk about what customer discovery is. And then I'll talk to you about how to put a good plan together briefly and then where you can get more information on that. But if uh, everyone on this call probably recognizes what this is, uh, you know, creating a, a hypothesis, creating tests and interviews, assess, analyze, and then adjust a pivot, and then go back and repeating this process. It's basically guess, ask, listen, and then guess again. It's a scientific method. Customer discovery is nothing more than the, the scientific method applied to a business model with what you're working on. And then when we use that, we have, a, we have this tool that if you're in, in by now, you know, this, this process has been uh, popularized for about the last 10 years or maybe seven or eight years. Uh, this is the business model canvas. Most people have seen the business model canvas nowadays. It's nothing more than a scorecard 
that we use to keep track of customer discovery. It's pretty much industry standard now. Uh, and this is what we use to, to keep track of it. So I won't spend much time here, but uh, the key parts of a good customer discovery plan are, uh, if I was gonna focus on something for putting together a solid uh, SBIR, it would be focusing on your customers, identifying who your key customers are, identifying your key value propositions for those customers, and then I, conducting interviews to make sure that your hypotheses around customers and value propositions are correct, and then creating a consistent narrative throughout your proposal, and then tying that narrative to your support letters. Okay, so let me give you let me give you a quick example of how I would do this in a proposal, and then I'll talk to you about how you can actually conduct this or a good way to do it if you haven't already done it. Okay, so is what I always recommend, and I'll, I'll briefly talk about this in a few minutes, is the key thing for me is when you're writing a proposal is really nailing your customer discovery right at the beginning of the proposal, okay? So uh, if I've got a hypothesis around, uh, if I was, so I'll give you an example for me specifically, is when I was launching, uh, or my team was launching Pattern Insight, it was a code quality tool, okay? That helped you increase the quality of your software. And we had a, we had a hypothesis that if we could help you find a bug in your code, software bug, we could help you fix it everywhere in your code, okay? So most large software bases have millions of lines of code. And when you have a bug in your code, it's that bug lives everywhere, many places in your code. You just don't know where it's at. So our value proposition was we can help you find that bug. If you find that bug once, we can help you fix it everywhere, okay? We had that hypothesis that that was a big problem. Okay. And then we created some tests, helped run, helped some people run those uh, demos, and we uh, helped, we, we validated that that was a problem for people. Okay. And so we created that, we had that statement in there, and then we had some quotes from people that that was a painful problem. Okay. So we wrote that right in the introduction of an SBIR. Okay. And it was right up front, and we could quantify how painful that problem was and have it right up front in the introduction, okay? And then you have some supporting statements uh, in some solid support letters in the back that tie back to that narrative. And then that narrative feeds through the rest of the, uh, the uh, proposal, okay? So hopefully that makes, uh, makes sense, okay? Any questions on that? So hopefully that's pretty straightforward, but that's what, uh, that's what I talk about, a key customer discovery plan. If you haven't done this, a good way to do customer discovery, as we mentioned, is the i program, okay? I just have a, sh a slide here that shows the different versions of i that are run, uh, run through here. Uh, you can take i usually on your campus. We run some regional programs, and then there's a national i program. By this point, most people know about what i is. It's a program that forces you to go through customer discovery and answer some of these questions. The thing that I'll say about i right now is that teams that participate in i their chance of success from an SBIR proposal goes up about five times. That's, from, uh, that's according to the National Science Foundation. Okay. If you're interested in participating in i and you've not, just reach out to someone at Enterprise Works or myself, and we can help you get connected. Okay. Okay. So a question is, when is the, I did catch that one. When is the next i launching? So Catherine has put the date in there, June 2nd. So if you go to Catherine, and if Ka Catherine will put a link in the, in the chat to where you can uh, find information on that. You can email Catherine. So perfect. Uh, any other questions? Great. Okay. So the next thing I'll talk a little bit about is I'll talk about a few of my uh, objectives and goals when writing the SBIR uh, proposal. And then I'll talk a little bit about the different sections in the commercialization plan. 
Okay. So I think it's really important to think about uh, the, the objectives when writing a proposal. Uh, and that helps me is when I'm framing how I'm going to write it. So a couple of things that I always have in my mind when I'm putting together a proposal, and I'm thinking about here, and I'll talk in general uh, about a phase one. Uh, I'm thinking about it when I'm putting together a phase one is that a phase one is a feasibility study, okay? Proof of concept feasibility study. That's important to think about. Uh, I put in here appearance of a phase two B company. Now that's, uh, uh, I think some of the other agencies have phase twos. Uh, NSF has a phase two B. Let me tell you, talk about what that is because I think it's important. Uh, NSF, I've heard several times, has a metric of uh, phase 2B companies. That's uh, several program directors have told me over the years that that's one of the things that they, that they uh, hold up as successes. So the, 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 I don't have the slide in here, but it shows you the overview of the, the NSF program. You have a phase one, then you go to phase two. Phase 2B companies are ones that actually get an outside investment, which can be either sales or an investment from a third party, like uh, venture capital or uh, uh, some other, uh, it's either venture capital, angel money, or sales, okay? So if you get to phase two, you're actually getting validated by an outside entity, okay? So that means you're a successful company in their eyes. So I always think about when I'm writing it, I wanna make sure, do everything I can to give, the, uh, to give them confidence that you are going to be a successful phase 2B company, okay? So I just keep that in mind when I'm writing it. And that's what I also I mean by appearance of a winner, okay? That you've done everything or you're doing everything to ensure that you're going to be a winning company and have a, and be a phase 2B company, okay? Uh, that goes along with gain their trust as well. It's important that you can gain the trust of your program directors because they ultimately make all of the decisions, okay? Uh, the, if I, I was talking to someone else earlier today and, and explaining this to them as well. Uh, the important thing is that when you go to the, uh, the one of the things I've noticed is when you go to the uh, the, the conference where they have the uh, the the people that receive the the uh, awards is that they often ask lots of questions. The answer to all of the questions is always talk to your program director, talk to your program director. Okay, if you want to change your proposal, the answer is talk to your program director. Okay, if you're on a review panel, the answer is always. Uh, uh, the, is, is what happens is the, you, uh, the, the committee that reviews the proposal gives the, gives the information to the program director, but ultimately the program director will, makes the decision. So you want to gain the trust of your program director and, and that they have confidence that you will be a successful company. Okay? And then finally, uh, build momentum in your phase two and write it in there about how you're, you're, uh, what you're doing in phase two that you have a plan for a, or in your phase one proposal that you have a plan for a phase two. All of these things as I'm writing my phase one proposal uh, shows that you're, you're a strategic and, you're, and, you, and you have plans for a phase two and, and you actually have plans to be a successful company, okay? All right, a couple of other things that are important as well. Uh, for a, for a, a phase one, you want to make sure that you write it so a technical person in a different field can understand it, okay? This is also very important because uh, people like me review these proposals. I may not be in the field that you're in, okay? So for instance, uh, you might be doing a, a, a phase imaging microscopy company, okay? That may not be my background, but I may be one of the reviewers on that. So for if you if you take uh, if you're writing one for the NSF, they're going to have commercial reviewers like me on there reviewing your proposal. So if you write it using all kinds of technical jargon, I'm going to review your proposal and it's to your detriment if I can't understand what you're doing at least at a high level. Okay? So keep that in mind as you're writing your proposal. So typically their panels have half at least at NSF it's half technical reviewers, half commercial reviewers who are technical people, but aren't necessarily from your field. Okay. Uh, NSF is gonna have high risk reviewers or, or they, they want your proposals to be high risk, right? They're not gonna fund things that aren't high risk, okay? They wanna fund things that are uh, too risky for venture capitalists to fund at that point. So they wanna help you de-risk so other investors can step in. So keep that in mind as well. Okay, uh, and, and again, some of these are very specific to uh, NSF, but I think it's important to keep in mind as well for other agencies, because some of the other agencies are 
developing i programs as well. So I think it's important also to be strategic and just remember uh, that these agencies are pouring a lot of money into i programs. So remember, what are the concepts that i teaches you? Okay, they teach you about customer discovery, getting out and incorporating the voice of the customer into your as you're developing your products and innovations. So think about what concepts do you learn doing i and customer discovery and make sure you incorporate those concepts into your proposal as you're writing it. That makes a lot of sense, because if you think about it, they are dumping hundreds of millions of dollars into i and those concepts are actually filtering out throughout their agency. So make sure you think about what do you learn from the, that program and make sure you're incorporating that in. Okay. So for sake of time, I'll skip this and I'll get onto a couple of other points. Uh, these slides will be shared. We'll make sure we share these right after. Okay. So now as we get into the commercialization section, I think of the elevator pitch is a, an important part of your commercialization plan. Okay. Uh, you want to make sure your elevator pitch is compelling. Uh, as, as I talked about earlier and gave you an example, you want to make sure you work the, the voice of the customer right into your elevator pitch. Uh, and, and a couple of key things to think about. When you're developing your elevator pitch, I always feel like it's much better if you can find a real world problem uh, that's going on right now in the world that the reviewers are going to be able to understand and relate to and tie the problem you're solving to that. Okay. Uh, let me give you an example. So when we were working with a team at Enterprise Works a few years ago that did underwater uh, communications, okay, underwater acoustic communications, like think modems that work underwater. At the time, uh, they were working with uh, talking to oil and gas companies about communicating from uh, the boats on the top of the water to the ground level of the uh, of, of the oceans. And at the time, there was actually at the time, if you remember, it was the deep water horizon, the gas, the oil spill that was burning. It was a it was about a year after that. And there were actually lots of uh, articles that was talking about if they had a way to communicate wirelessly, they could have uh, uh, prevented that that fire from happening, that tragic fire. So we were able to write when we were writing the SPIR, we were able to write and really tie the, the, the need for such underwater communications from the top of the ocean to the to the ground floor. So when you write something like that, the reviewers can actually see, okay, I can see the real benefit of uh, in dollar amounts of, of this technology, okay? So, so look for things like that where you can tie your problem to uh, something that's in the world that everybody can relate to and understand, okay? So as I mentioned also, if you can, if you can tie your problem to it, you can come up with three compelling value propositions that you deliver, and then you can actually have the voice of the customer come in here and actually give you a quote of why current solutions don't meet their needs. And you can tie that right into the very uh, front of your elevator pitch, right at the very front of the uh, part, or front part of the document. Okay. Then, uh, and then address how your innovation meets that need. And you all have that, and it's, it needs to be compelling. The last thing I'll say about this elevator pitch Remember, as a reviewer, reviewers have hundreds of pages to, to review. Uh, you'll typically get six to 12 documents to or six to 12 proposals to review uh, on any given uh, panel. And as a reviewer, I'm going to review every one of those pages at least once, if not twice. And if they're, if they're boring, uh, it's a lot harder to review than ones that are compelling. That's just human nature. So I always tell people as I'm writing a proposal, I want something that catches my attention or I want, I want the reviewers to catch, I want to catch their attention and make them want to read the rest of my proposal. Yeah. So hopefully that, uh, that resonates with you and makes sense. Okay, so I think I talked about this. I think a couple of other points that I'll make here is make sure that uh, you can have real data and the voice of the customer. So I've talked about that and be as, be as specific as possible with, uh, with those examples. Okay, uh, let's see. I think the other things that here that I haven't covered already is um, that uh, describe your commercialization approach, how you're gonna take it to market. I think as specific as you can, it can be there. Uh, economic benefit, we've talked about that as well. Uh, I think anytime you can be specific and have specific numbers is, is a good thing and be realistic. So sometimes you'll see people have uh, 
uh, crazy numbers that aren't realistic. Uh, that happens often, but I think you want to be realistic. And I, I would be, uh, but let me let me let me also point out that uh, there's a fine line to to balance there because sometimes when you get when you get proposals and they say, you know, we're we're gonna, you know, this is this is the best technology in the world, and if we do this and this, we're gonna be really successful, and we're gonna be able to make four million dollars. That's our market size. I mean, that's not compelling. So I think you need to, you know, you need to work with somebody to, to help you to build your market and your commercial opportunity and show that you've got, you know, something that the NSF should care about. And something like a four or five million dollar market opportunity might seem like a large number to you, but that's not that's not a large opportunity. And so I say be realistic, meaning that you know, you don't want to say that this is a trillion dollar opportunity. Uh, or, or, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars, but at the same time, it needs to be a compelling opportunity. Uh, I put down there, uh, don't forget to back up your assumptions. So you should, you should list all your assumptions, you know, list your assumptions that you're making and be able to back some of them up. And then I put down there, has your opportunity been validated? One of the most important things you can do is uh, show how you've done some customer discovery and validated the uh, opportunity that you have. Uh, for instance, if you've done some pilot projects with people, and uh, specifically if it's like a, name, a named company, uh, anything you've done like that that can validate that you have something behind it, even if it's just you know early demonstrations in your lab and you've got some feedback from customers, anything you can do like that is really compelling uh, to the reviewers. So. All right, any, any uh, questions that have popped up so far? Uh, actually, I have a uh, one question just about uh, you saying that we can basically uh, tell the reviewer that we have a pilot project with a customer, uh -huh. but uh, do we need uh, customer's approval to show their name in the reports, in the proposal, I mean? I mean, that, that, that depends on your relationship with that customer. I, I mean, I, I've put customers in, in the proposal before. Uh, but we didn't have any non-disclosure agreement with the customer. So it, 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 it's, it certainly depends on your, uh, your relationship with the customer, what agreement you have with them. Okay. So let, let, me, let me say this as well. These are not, when, when you put together an SBIR proposal, I'm going to speak to the NSF because I can't speak to the other agencies, but with the NSF ones, they are not considered under, now the, now the reviewers, are the reviewers sign documents that they will not disclose any information, but the, what you put in their proposal is not considered under NDA unless there's some information. You can actually highlight some information in your proposal that is not supposed to be disclosed anywhere, but you shouldn't consider that all your information is top secret and will not be shared anywhere. Okay? Sure. Thanks. So think about it like that. But I, I've I've put I've put information in SBIRs before that we've done uh, we've done projects with uh, specific companies that are big name co co companies. If you're concerned about that, and um, let's say let's say I, okay, I'm just going to throw a name out there, just random name. Like let's say let's say you did something with uh, State Farm or Allstate. I just you know randomly pick those names. If you did something with a project with a company like that. And you were hesitant to do that, you could say something like, "We've done a project with a uh, a Fortune 500 company in the insurance industry," something like that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Good question. Anything you can do to give the reviewers confidence that you are that you've proved it out would it, would it will help your case? Yes. Thanks. Uh, good question. Any other questions before I move on? Yep, I, I have a question uh -huh. along similar lines. Uh, I was wondering what is the, like at this early stage when we do customer discovery uh, and let's say we find a need in the market, then uh, how reasonable is it to ex expect, like let's say we don't, we are not, but we are not able to do what you were able to do, which is demo for the client. And not, ev not everybody can do it. And so if we haven't shown the customer that we can really solve their problem, uh, theoretically we can, but practically we haven't shown anything, how likely is it that a company would, uh, like a manager at a company would write a letter of support? What, I'm sorry, I didn't catch that last part. How likely is it that a, a somebody at the company will let you do what? Like let you put a letter of support in? Yeah, yeah. It, 
it, it, it's a good question. And that's, it's difficult, right? It, it can be difficult. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the letters of support and some things that you can do, but it really depends. And sometimes you have to get creative with it because a lot of company, it depends on the company, right? I mean, there's, there's a large company that, that I've, I've worked with before that anytime you ask for a letter of support, they would require you to go to legal. And anytime you heard that, it was like, all right, we're done. And, and so, but I, but I know sometimes that you can go there and you can actually, if you, if you're pretty good relationship with a certain person there, they will just write a letter of report and won't even ask anything. And, and I will tell you over the years, my experience has been over the years, it's been easier to get letters of support from companies, a lot easier to get letters of support. So it's a, it's a good question. And I think you got to get creative about it, but I think it's much easier to get letters of support nowadays. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that. And when we get to letters of support. Thanks. Yeah. Rosalba had a question as well. I don't know if she wants to ask you live, but she said for a phase one, is it recommended you show ability to acquire funds through sales or venture capital? Absolutely. You should always show anything you can do, anything you can do to show support, uh, revenue, venture capital, anything like that is, a, is the strongest letter show of support that'll help you because it shows somebody's actually, that you have something, somebody's willing to commit. And just that uh, Abhinav, what he was just asking, uh, demonstrates how difficult it is to get support. And so when somebody actually commits money to it, it's the strongest show of support that you can get. I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end when we get to letters of support and show of support. But if you can do it, absolutely. If you can't, we can talk about some more strategies you can do to show support. That's what I'm always trying to get. Okay. So let me talk, let me see where I had them on slides. Okay. Let me talk about a couple of things here because I want to address this niche market versus uh, versus the overall market. Because I made a comment a few minutes ago that some may that that what I'm going to say here may may somebody may think I'm conflicting with um, with what I just said. So I said a few minutes ago, I was like, what if your market? When I said be realistic, and what if your market is like only four million dollars, and you think that's large? Okay, there is an opportunity for you to 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 target a niche market that may only be four million dollars. Okay. So let me give you an example. We had a company here at Research Park that's been one of our successful companies. When they wrote their SBIR, uh, they, they, were, they were going after a very specific market that the worldwide uh, total market that they were going after was $4 million. Okay? Now, that is not very large in the grand scheme of things, especially in the views of the NSF, but they had a particular case that they were <laughs> a very particular market they were going after where they knew and this is the only time I've ever seen this. They knew every single customer in the world that bought their product and every single customer in the world knew them. And the particular person that made their product, the only other company in the world that made their product, the machine that made it broke. And that, that company said, oh, forget it. We're not going to repair the machine. Okay. And so this market was wide open. And they had an opportunity to dominate that niche market. Okay. So they had a compelling case to dominate this niche market that they were going after. Okay. So they were able to craft their SBIR proposal that said, sure, we're going after this niche market for $4 million, but there are other opportunities outside of that that we believe we could go after later. We don't quite know what they are right now. We've got some possibilities but we're going to dominate this niche market right now. Okay. So there are things, there are compelling cases you can make, even if you have a really small market that you're going after right now. Okay. That's it. There's an opportunity to do that. If you've ever read the book, Crossing the Chasm, if you haven't, I recommend you read that book, but there are compelling reasons or compelling cases you can make if your market's small. Okay. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's something to think about there. Um, so a couple of other points there for, for so we can move on and, and save some time for some other points. On your commercialization strategy, the, the two key points there I'll make there at the bottom there, make sure that your, your, your strategy that you're employing is consistent within your industry, okay? So that's another important, important point that can come up. If you're proposing some commercialization strategy that is completely different than, than, than the norms within your, within your industry, uh, you better make a very strong case for, for the reason why, okay? 
because if not, it looks very strange. So I've seen that happen before where it often, and it'll come up in discussions with your, within your group. Um, so just think about that as you're putting it to, if, if you're, when you're putting together your commercialization plan. Uh, it, it also, it's not, it's not a bad idea to refer to other models. Uh, with, if, you're, if you're proposing something, like if you're in the software industry and you're proposing a, you know, a, a software as a service model, you can refer to, here's other companies that do it a similar way and it's an accepted strategy in our industry. That doesn't, it's, it's not a bad idea to do that. Just on proposing is, don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to, unless you've got a very compelling reason why. Okay. Industry overview. Um, make sure that you've got, uh, show that you understand your industry. That's the key thing to do there is uh, if you're giving an, over, an industry overview, make sure that you don't uh, miss things, miss companies. Uh, an interesting, let me just point out something here that's a potential uh, a potential thing that you, you don't want to step in is what, one time that, that, uh, that can pop up, especially at a university like the University of Illinois, is there could, it, it's potential, it, it's a potential uh, issue where there could be similar companies in your industry that the NSF has funded on your campus or in, in the industry that could be, um, the, the just not, not necessarily not even necessarily on your campus, but uh, funded by your program director in the last couple of years. Just do your research because they do notice that. So I can give you a specific example. Uh, there was a company that I was working with here on our campus that that program director had funded one of their competitors the year before, and uh, we we made sure that he had uh, that they included that in their industry overview. So it made so it was clear that they had done their done their research on it and the program director noticed it and they were both in the cybersecurity space it's these little details that make a lot of difference when you're putting your proposal together so keep that in mind so you don't want to you want to make sure that you uh you 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 look that think that through just you, it's very easy to see what other pro what other teams that the uh, program directors have funded over the years okay so just keep that in mind Okay, uh, the one thing I'll, I'll and again, I'll, I'll send these slides out here. Uh, I just want to make sure I hit on a couple of key things here. So the innovation, the right here, let me hit on the IP landscape, because here's another, here's another thing that you might uh, run into here, is with IP intellectual property, the key thing that I'll say here that I, like, I want people to focus on when they're putting together their, their plan is there's a lot of red flags that you can land on here. I think the key thing about your intellectual property section when you're putting together your proposal, the key thing is not to raise red flags, okay? So your proposals will have a section on IP landscape. The key things to make sure are that you're very clear, you're using the right language, so it, so it shows that you know about intellectual uh, property. If you're coming out of the university, you want to make sure that you are clear that you have talked to the tech transfer office. If it's from the university, you want to make sure that you're clear that you have access to the IP. Okay. And you want to make sure that you have an IP, uh, you have an IP plan. Okay. That's it. And uh, it, it, it's possible that you have open source, you have intellectual property and it's, uh, it's open source. That's fine as well. It's it just makes sure that uh, it, it's that you have a clear that you have clear uh, plan, okay. And it might be that you're gener generating intellectual property going forward. It's just you want to make sure that you have a you have a clear plan and that uh, it, it's it you've got a plan to to going forward. And you're using the right language, okay. That's the key thing, okay. And. Uh, uh, you just don't want to raise red flags, okay? Okay, and uh, Mariana, you've asked some questions there, and I think hopefully I've, I've addressed them there. It's there's nothing, there's no problem with, uh, there's no problem if you've got okay, all right, thumbs up, we've got it. Okay, just again, the main thing is you don't want to raise red flags. I've seen people get hung up because it does, it's not clear that they haven't talked to the tech transfer office. So I think I've, I think I've mentioned that as well. Okay.
All right, company and team, I think this is pretty straightforward. Um, let, let me just address something here. I don't think I have it on the slides. Let me just be very clear that uh, the, the, the program managers, are they understand, especially on a phase one proposal, they understand that most teams are have gaps on their team and that a lot of them are one person teams and they're completely fine with that. I think it's always important that you call out any gaps that you may have and how you plan on addressing them. So don't be concerned about that with your teams. Uh, I think it's always better that you you list uh, you you mention how you've got gaps and how you're filling them. Uh, teams that are, are from Illinois. Uh, let me just mention how I would recommend teams from the University of Illinois to address that. And then if you're not from the University of Illinois, you can see how we would address it here and how you could similarly address it. So if you're a team from the University of Illinois and you may be uh, missing a business person, you can mention how you're you are involved with Enterprise Works and that you're leveraging the, enter, the entrepreneurs and residents at, at Enterprise Works to assist in business uh, in, in, the, in the strategic planning and the uh, business management. Like you can mention something like that. Uh, if you're not at University of Illinois, you're probably close to some similar, uh, uh, some similar organization that can help as the advisors as well, okay? And so is what you're doing, if you, if you do that, is what you're showing is that you recognize that you've got a gap and you're showing how you're gonna fill that gap in the short term, okay? That's very important to do. I've heard them say many times that it's not the, uh, it's, not the, it's not the gaps that are the problem, it's when teams have gaps and they don't recognize it, that's the problem, okay? So it's important to do that. Okay, so let me spend the last few minutes before I just open the rest of the time up to question and answer. Uh, let me talk about support. So we've had a couple of questions about support and I look at it like this. So you've kind of got this continuum of support. You've got on the one side, the absolute best thing you could get is a purchase order or actually like money in the bank. Somebody's actually purchased something or a purchase order, uh, just customers, customers in general or investors. And I actually mean like investors that have actually put money into it. Okay. That's the best thing you could get. And then on the other end, is just a generic, well, like nothing. That's actually that's actually probably the, the lowest end is like actually no letters of support. And you want something, you, you, you absolutely want all the letters of support you can get, okay? Uh, I think on the current one, I can't remember now if it's five or three. Uh, it used to be three, but I, I think it's still three for a phase one, letters of support. I would use every single one of them, okay? Uh, and you, you want the best letters of support you can get. And is what I've got thing here, character, characters of, of good letters of sort, characters of bad one, okay? So you want people to actually uh, commit something, okay? And you want it to be consistent with your narrative, okay? But I, I actually look, want people to actually commit something that I want them to actually commit uh, money if they can. If not, I want them to commit uh, actual uh, time and effort if, 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 if they can't commit money. So if I can get them to actually commit uh, to help me test the product, I will, uh, or, or can commit some type of resource. And there's two types of things that they can do. You can actually get them to validate. And, and so that's one type of letter of support. Then the other one, uh, I'm looking for somebody to like help validate the technology. Okay. So those are, those are the types of letters of support. Now, let me talk about characteristics of bad letters of support. Okay. Because you actually see these often. So often somebody will have a letter of support from an investor. And it'll be an investor that doesn't actually, hasn't actually invested in their technology. And they always read the same way. It always says something like, this technology looks really interesting. And we are, we are investors. It always has like some paragraph that talks about how they're investors and they invest in early technologies. And we think this is very promising and we look forward to following you along your road to commercialization. It says something like that. And as a reviewer, I always just look at it. You know, you just look at it and go, oh, that's a generic letter that you probably sent to a thousand people. And, and I always think it's interesting that you haven't thought it's important enough to invest in it yet. So that's like not a great letter of support. And then the other thing that I think is always, always uh, interesting is uh, <laughs> the other thing that's interesting is when you get a letter of support. Now, I, you brought that some of you will do this. So, so just I'm telling you this so you can, you can make sure you don't do this. 
is that you can tell when some but that one of you one of the one of the team members has written all of the letters of support especially if english is not your native language because you will get an odd sentence that appears in all the letters of support okay so if you're going to write the letters of support make sure that a different person on your team writes it okay and, and adjust the format too like maybe maybe move some of the paragraphs around okay so or it's a non-commitment commitment or like support letter right where i already mentioned one of those but these are some things that you you don't want to do right you you don't want to do those because it's much better if you have letters of support which look like they're all different and people are giving you real support and they took time to actually write the letter okay now so let me tell you what i do when i review and i know this i know a lot of people do this i actually had a program director tell me he does the same thing when he reviews one of these proposals he gets a proposal and i do this i get a proposal the first thing i do i read the one page summary and then i turn to the back and i go right to the support letters and I read the support letters. And then at the bottom, I actually write a note of what was committed in that support letter. Okay, like what did they get any support? Did the person commit to anything? What did they actually say in that support letter? And then I'll go back and I'll start reading the, the proposal. Okay. Okay. Any questions about that? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead, hi. Eugene. Uh, yes, hi, thank you. Uh, if you have uh, support in terms of um, revenue, uh, mm -hmm. how, do you how, how do you demonstrate that? Do you just show them a, a table with uh, customer name and revenue that they've spent with you? Uh, good, good, good question. So first of all, I'd try to get that customer to write a support letter and talk about what they did. That's the first thing I would try to do. Uh, yeah, our challenge may be that some of our customers are very big companies where they're not willing to put their name on a letter, but they have paid or are paying for the service. How, how much has a like? Are these are these thousands of like tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars? Are these large contracts? Y yes, yes. These are tens and hundreds, or uh, up to hundred. So it, it is possible you could if, if it's large you could um you should talk to the program director you could reach out to the program director i'm trying to think i may have attached a, a purchase order as a support letter one time i believe i have done that before but i talked to the program director first you can certainly write it in you certainly write it into the proposal yeah, yeah, yeah. our challenge is our customers are big enough that they are going to raise uh the the, the issue you, you said before with legal you know involvement yeah, in yeah. everything and so we just don't want to rock that boat <laughs> I, I i would here's what i would do i would if you're writing if you're support if you're going to the nsf i would talk to the uh i would talk to the program director and have a conversation with him and tell them who they are <laughs> that's what i would do i just i mean if you can do that uh i would talk to the program director so he know or he or she knows right because it's uh, i would talk to the program director so uh she knows or he knows who that who it is because always remember that it's like i said it's it's you're trying to build trust with the program director and i would want that program director to know that you have raised that money and so when they review your proposal Jed, could you do something like black out who would the name of the company on the purchase order or things that keep the confidentiality because I think he's explaining he needs to maintain under an NDA or something like this. It, but, uh, yeah, we have definitely have very strict NDA NDAs in place. So, so if there are NDAs that you can't tell them, then yes, I would do something like that. I mean, you certainly, so you would certainly, you could certainly do something like this. You could put a table in and you could say, if these are like fortune 50 companies or something like that, then you can say, you know, we have revenue from Fortune 50 companies, from three Fortune 50 companies, like something like that. Any, I just think about it like this, as much information as you can disclose, you want to have it in there to your advantage. Yep, that, that, that's helpful, just, thank you. If you described in Jed, even if it's, you know, it's a, a, a publicly traded company in yep. the consumer packaged goods space, or it's a yep. defense, it's a prime, 
defense contractor or something that describes it without naming them, maybe? Yep. As much information as you can, it's to your advantage that they know. And even, even if it's, even if it's finding a way to talk to the program director and letting her know that you have, that, that you have these three things and asking for her help in how to phrase it, that's a way to like, let them know who you are, that your company and you've got this success. I, it's all about building, you know, trust with your program director help. And you can ask them to help you solve this problem. I, that's, you know, and then, and then doing just like Laura said, that's how I would do it. Hopefully that helps. Yes. Thanks. Other questions that, Hey, and also that's a really nice problem to have. <laughs> okay. Other questions. So Jed, there's a question. What about letters from manufacturers or suppliers? I would assume that that might not be as effective since essentially you are paying them, not the yeah. other way around. Yeah, if that's if that's the purpose of it, so so I think about it like this. If if you've got three letters of support, I think if like Laura said, if you're paying them, that's a, that's not a strong letter of support. I, I'd have to see like why what's your purpose of, of of having them in there. If it's just to show that you're able to deliver on the product. That's better than nothing, but it's not what I would have as one of my three letters of support unless I don't have any other options. Uh, if it's to, to show as a joint venture or partnership to go after larger customers, I, I, I would still I would still be trying to have I would still try be trying to show that I have larger partners or customers wanting to buy my product first before I build something that that no one wants. But again, it's better than nothing. But I would I, on, on my continuum of here's the best letters of support and here's lower ones, I would put it on a lower one in terms of, you know, where on that scale. Because I would be trying to show that I've got I've got bigger one, you know, you know, the uh, higher up the, the, the chain of I, I want, you know, I want ones up here that show that they're actually going to buy my product. That's what I would want. I could give an example of where a, a letter from a manufacturer might be a very strong one. If the manufacturer knows the marketplace and says, this is a great, great marketplace, and we will commit at no charge to working with you to develop a prototype because we want to sell it through you, that kind of letter and that kind of commitment meets all the qualifications of validating the marketplace and demonstrating commitment of a major partner in the field. It could, yeah. That that would, if it's written like that, that could be yes, because that that serves that purpose. I had a question yeah. just about letters. Yeah, um, we work in our. My company is, you know, medical software and using VR and things like this. And you know, we, one of our um, we got letters of support. I thought that were quite good. And one of them was from one of the deans at, involved with the Carl Illinois Medical School. And um, she had, or the dean had indicated that yes, we're very interested in this. We'd like to develop this and would like to use this, and are interested in purchasing this in the future. And she sits on a lot of committees with, you know, American College of Surgeons and other other um, things of that nature. And um, and the comment on the letter that we got, you know even though they had very good credentials and, you know, were from Carl and it was University of Illinois. Well, who's this Carly, Carly place? What does that have to do with anything? And I just didn't know if there was maybe some PR or information we could share with NSF so that they really understand the medical ecosystem in our community better, because that's a pretty high up letter and they made a commitment to help develop and purchase uh, the product. And so I just don't know if they're not familiar because we're not Mayo Clinic or you know something bigger, but it just seems like some uh, that that would help uh, in at, at least for medical product development. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that or why there's such a weird, like not understanding of of us since we're so involved? No, I, I would have to I'd have to see that that comment that that they sent back. That was in the review that you received. Uh, that was in our um, afterwards. We had one that didn't quite make it, and um, they put that it, with the comment, or you know, when we had the interview with the program director. I mean, there was just a real information gap, like not understanding yeah. 
we had another letter from one of the American academies of, of a specialty and uh, they said the same type of con comment, like we're very interested in this, we'd like to work with them to develop this, we're, we're interested in testing it, you know, same types of things what you coach us, right, because we listen pretty closely to all the great information we get. And again, they just didn't like understand that. I, I'm sure Enterprise Works can always help you get, uh, you know, any materials that you need to put together. And, and then let me, and, and thanks for that, Dr. Jones. I think the other thing that I will add that brings up a good point, and and, and I, don't, I don't know what your proposal looked like and, and what sure. your, your letters were. Uh, right. I think in general, and, and I think Carl is fine. Carl, uh, and, and again, on our letters, on our, you know, continuum of letters of support, Carl, Carl would be fine. I think it, I think something that I always recommend as well that you, and may have, maybe this was an issue, maybe it wasn't, but I think in general, I shy, I tell people to shy away from getting letters of support from the, if, if you are from the, and, and yours is different because you were not from the University of Illinois, right. but I, I, I recommend people get letters of support outside of the University of Illinois, because typically when people review, if they see something attached or associated with their university, right. I think it carries less weight because people mm -hmm. go, oh, of course they're going to say something nice. They're from the yeah. same university. They're on the same payroll. Even right, if you're right. not, even if you're not, there's yeah. the perception. Okay. You know, so they didn't, they I, didn't even know what Carl was. And, yeah. and it was, this person was a Dean at the University of Illinois. I mean, technically from Chicago, cause that's like the school at the time I think was transitioning. Yeah. So again, I just think that was a weird yeah. thing. Maybe it was just us, but I just thought okay. that was unusual. So, but I'll show them to you and ha have you look at the proposal and maybe, maybe I'm missing something from it. But I think some PR work about the medical ecosystem here is really critical to helping make those connections with, the, with NSF and maybe even NIH. Okay. Another point that raises is that it could, it can be really helpful in a letter to quickly establish the writer's standing in the community. You know, if a writer says, "I'm a distributor globally of this product, and I, I'm, you know, I've got millions of dollars worldwide," that's good to say briefly in a letter to establish standing. Sure. No, that's a that's a good point. I could we could make some alterations in that manner, but thank you. All right. Uh, other questions. I think we have time for one more. Uh, I had a quick question about IP that you mentioned. Uh -huh. um, so I guess how, might be a vague question, but I'm just kind of wondering how in depth should we show our plan for, for getting IP? Um, should we just kind of show that, that the technology is worthy of IP and that's, that's enough or... I think so. I I'll I'll talk I'll talk about how I typically do it or my recommendations, and Roland can chime in if he's got other thoughts. I think my my approach for the what I recommend on the section for IP is again uh, just reiterate that you you don't want to raise red flags in the IP section. I think there's some things that you do and things you don't do, and I think the key thing is get across of what you have, what intellectual property you have. And it's, you know, some people are open source, some people are, you know, some people have current or intellectual property now. And then you, you, if you're at the university, you want to make sure that you are clear that you've been involved, you've involved the tech transfer office. And then uh, you talk about uh, what your current plans are and what you're going to do in the future. And, and that if you've got, if you've got a lawyer involved now, that you make sure that you list that person uh, as your, as your counsel for intellectual property. But I think there's key things that you want to, and then you want to make sure that you you talk the right language, and it doesn't have to be a long section. I mean, a typical NSF one is, you know, it's a, just a small paragraph, or maybe, you know, maybe a quarter of a page is your intellectual property plan. But it's very easy to screw that section up, and, and I've seen I've seen that section uh, result in long conversations and people asking a lot of question, questions about their IP. Uh, but if you just if you just say the right things in that section. And not raise red flags. People review it and they move on to something else. Okay, and so I think those are the key things. And and a lot of things like sometimes the section is just here's the intellectual property we have. We have we have access to use it. And in the future, any IP that we own, it's going to be used by the it's going to be owned by the company. And it says and, and it says we have legal counsel and here's who represents us. And then you read it. And it's like okay, that's great. They know what they're doing and they've done this before. And the university knows what's going on and they move on. It's just that simple. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that makes sense. 
just a quick follow-up that's okay um is it is it looked down upon if you don't have any sort of ip going or you haven't looked into it and at, at all i i think it's a red flag if you haven't looked into it like mm -hmm. that's a that's a red flag i think if you i i, I think if you're it, it's it's you 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 just you can you, it's very easy to screw it up if you don't have ip uh, if you're open source, I think it, you can get by with it. If it's like we we if it's developed at the university, we've involved the tech transfer office, and we made a decision to go open source, right? I've seen many I've seen many companies do that, and that's mm -hmm. acceptable. But I think the key thing there is that you've involved the tech transfer office, and it was a strategic decision, and you have a plan going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would say if you have any specific if you have any specific questions, you know, you can reach out to somebody. At, at, I don't know where yeah. uh, where are you located at? I'm in Champaign. Uh, so, so I'd reach out to somebody at, at Enterprise Works, and you can awesome. talk about it in more uh, detail if you've got some questions. Cool. Thanks. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, so I, I think we're out of time. If there's any other questions. Uh, let's see. So let me just just to follow up on that. Uh, Abhinav's got a question about if you have an arrangement with the university IP, should that be included in the letter? No, 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 no. I wouldn't write that. I, I just think, I think, uh, let's see, you're still on. So I think the 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 point there is just just saying that you've you've been you've 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 got access to the IP, I think is all you need to say. And that would show that you've talked to the tech transfer office, you've and, and you've got clearance to do it. That's all. I wouldn't include anything in there. So okay, great. So that's that's all I have. We'll make sure that you have a, a copy of the slides. I think the only other things I had in there were, uh, uh, you know, this this was brought to you by the uh, Midwest Icor Node and the Fast Center here at Enterprise Works. And uh, thanks everyone for participating. And uh, you know, reach out if you have any questions, and we're happy to try and uh, uh, help you with them. I had a picture of what a, a successful SBIR looks like. It's just a typical NSF proposal. I think Laura, we used to have a copy of an, an SBIR proposal linked to the Enterprise Work web, Enterprise Works website. Do we still have that? We do. It probably I'll have to check and see if we can update it with this one. Well, this is just a couple of pages. I think yours is probably uh, uh, better. I just remember it was there. So because I get questions often, is can I see an SBIR proposal? I think I just put it in here because I think it's important that an SBIR that it looks like an SBIR proposal. Uh, so I think that's important there and uh, that's it. So thanks everyone for attending and make sure you schedule time with uh, some of Roland and our SBR consultants and uh, reach out if you have questions. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Jed. We'll All right. Thank you. you. All thank later. You.